Alvedarisha, thank you so much for joining us in our newsroom today. Thank you for your invitation. Can you tell me a little bit about who you are, where you come from, and uh, your childhood, maybe? As a child, I just uh, wanted to become somebody in, in life. Uh, then I, I started my studies at the University of Pristina. I was one of the best students uh, of my generation. Uh, after that, I wanted to, uh, to participate in political life of Kosovo, but it was almost impossible because of nepotism and you had to know someone or you had to be part of uh, one uh, political party to have a job or to be part of uh, political, uh, political life. And it was uh, very hard to find myself in Kosovo. After that, I decided to continue my studies in Tirana. Uh, but at the end, uh, almost at the end of my studies, I decided to, uh, to join conflict in Syria. Uh, after I came back, then I, uh, I got graduated. And uh, after a few months, I got arrested. You decided to leave actually before you finished your degree. So wh what was it that actually made you change your mind from being a student, going to classes, and instead wanting to go to Syria and fight? I think it, it, was, just, uh, it was just time. I mean, uh, I didn't saw that I can be useful in Kosovo at that time, nor in Albania. So I wanted to help someone else, uh, someone who was in trouble. And uh, it was time that I, uh, I took the decision to, uh, to fight for Syrian opposition against the Assad regime. Uh, it was a very quick decision. Uh, I needed only one month to be prepared, to be ready for that trip, and uh, it happened uh, everything so fast. Can you tell us about how you prepared and what did you need to do in, order, in this month to, to get ready to go to Syria? Uh, first, uh, I will tell you the reasons why I wanted to help uh, Syrian opposition. It was first uh, about, uh, for the humanitarian reasons. Uh, because I saw people suffering from Assad regime and also I cannot deny that it was also the religious uh, reason. Uh, the majority of Muslim of uh, Syrian people belong to uh, Islamic religion, the same uh, religion uh, I belong to and it was somehow my duty to help my brothers and sisters who were suffering from Assad uh, Assad regime and uh, yeah I mean I didn't have something else to do and uh, it was one of other factors that uh, forced me to, to go to Syria. I started my, my journey at 6 October uh, and I came back in Pristina at 20 October, uh, it, at the year 2013. So all my trip was only two weeks long. Can you tell us something about the practicalities of, of getting to Syria? Did you go through a recruiter or were you, and how did you find the money to go? How much did it cost? Uh, I had my money already, but also I owned some money from, from a friend. Uh, we wanted to go together with uh, a few friends, but at the last moment they decided not to, not to go. Uh, I, I, I was alone uh, at Istanbul and also in Antakya I felt alone. Uh, there were few other guys who should wait it for me, but they didn't wait for me because they thought I'm a spy. They didn't know me at all, and one of them uh, was uh, forced to come back in Kosovo from Turkish authorities because he was there uh, w one time before that. And other guys, they just uh, didn't want me to. Uh, they didn't want to wait me, uh, so I continue my uh, journey. Uh, from Antakya to Kilis, and in Kilis I met through social network, through uh, Facebook, I met another guy. He was from a free Syrian army and he asked him, where do you want to go? I explained uh, the whole situation and I told him that I want to join Albanians in Syria. Can you tell me what it was like when you were crossing the border into Syria? How did it feel? What were you thinking about? It was a great feeling. I was very, very proud and I didn't know this, uh, I didn't have this feeling of fear from no one except God, I, I was ready to fight against the, all soldiers of Assad regime, but this kind of pride began to uh, become lower and lower when I met my Albanians who were part of uh, terrorist organizations. How did you cross? Was there anybody there showing you the way? or? I crossed the border with a motorbike together with uh, another guy, a Syrian guy, I paid him to cross the border and I crossed the border in the middle of the day. 
uh, there were there was no Turkish soldier. Uh, it was so easy to cross the border, and I think uh, in this in this war, Turkey has uh, had a big role and has also yet a big role. Uh, they just left us to to cross the border, which is somehow still uh, unacceptable for me. They had to stop us, but I think for political reasons they let us go in Syria. After crossing the border, I met two other guys from the Free Syrian Army, and that uh, that was the moment that the uh, situation went out of, of control. Uh, they sent, uh, sent me to Albanians, but suddenly Albanians were part of Al-Nusra. Al of course, I didn't want to join this group. At the time, someone else called me by phone and uh, told me, uh, come to our group because don't, don't stay there. And of course, I just uh, didn't want to be part of Al-Qaeda, so I uh, went to another uh, Albanian group. Uh, but even this group, I realized after, after a few days that this group were uh, ISIS, and I just want, uh, didn't want to join them also. And I finished in uh, third group, which was uh, uh, part of, uh, which was Ahral al-Sham, which is not uh, at the blacklist as a terrorist organization, and I was the only Albanian in that group. So I uh, risked my life twice, just not to be part of terrorist organizations. At that time, and still today, the Free Syrian Army and the opposition to Assad is quite fractured. Had you done a lot of research about the different opposition groups that you might have joined? Or? No, I didn't, uh, I didn't search so much about the, uh, about the groups in Syria. I just wanted to join Albanians. Uh, I didn't care if... Uh, I thought at least one of these groups would be uh, not part of a uh, terrorist organization. I, I hope that one of these groups would be part of Free Syrian Army. But uh, unfortunately, they, they were both, both a part of a uh, uh, list of terrorist organizations. So, uh, yeah, I, at the end, I decided to join one group who was not uh, at the blacklist. And I made a uh, search on the internet, and I found the list of the groups, and uh, the nearest group was Ahrar al -Sham. Did it surprise you that Albanians would be joining blacklisted groups or would be espousing such violent ideology? Uh, yes, it was uh, it was a big surprise for me. Um, it was not only surprise of belonging to these groups. It, it was surpri uh, surprise of the way of uh, how how they think, the way how they uh, how they do, and how they uh, they think about Kosovo, about other people, about other Muslims. Uh, the, in majority, they are they were Tekfiris, the people who. Uh, exclude others from Islam and want uh, and wanted monopoly of Islam and wanted monopoly of the right and can you elaborate a bit more on what they how they think about Kosovo I think that Kosovo is a state of uh, with the system non-islamic system so it's not uh, our state uh, it's not our state we have to build one state uh, according to Islamic values according to Islamic law and uh, yes, it's much uh, better to live in, according to them, to live in uh, the state, Islamic state, than to live in, uh, in Kosovo, uh, which is a secular state. How, what did you see about the quality of life that a lot of the people were living there? Did you find that it could resemble a normal life? I guess for some, uh, many families have gone to Syria and to Iraq now uh, with children. Did you find that, that they could live, I don't know, similar to a life that they were living in Kosovo? You, you cannot describe that kind of living as, as normal. It is uh, uh, living un, under, the, under the fire. It is uh, life uh, in the world and no one is, is living normal life there. Uh, I was surprised also to see families, to see small children. I didn't saw the woman there, but yeah, I saw children for uh, six years old, uh, seven years old, uh, carrying a uh, Kalashnikov or uh, holding a gun, and uh, it was it was a bad surprise. Was that part of the things that made you realize you wanted to come home? Yes, it was one of the things, but uh, not the main one. It uh, the main thing that. Uh, Convinced, uh, convinced me to, to come home was the fear not to uh, do some crime or the fear not to fight other Muslims and also it was the voice of my mother. Uh, it, I didn't uh, took her permission to, to go to Syria. She didn't even know that I will travel to Syria. She realized that, we, that I was in Syria only when I got arrested, not before. And uh, all the things uh, were 
coming together and I, I took the decision to come back because it's not, it was not my fight anymore. So you called her but you didn't tell her where you were? No, I didn't tell her. I didn't tell her. Has your idea then of Islam changed at all? So between deciding to go to Syria and coming back? Uh, before going to Syria I thought that all Muslims are victims, uh, that everyone is attacking us and we are uh, all the time under, under attack. Uh, it's not, we don't do mistakes, we are the best people of the planet. But when you go there you see people uh, with strange ideas and you realize that we have a big problem between us. And I think dealing with extremism uh, is our duty as Muslims. And uh, first of all, uh, we are the first front line, uh, front line to deal with extremism and extremists. It is our duty and uh, uh, that, was the, I, uh, that was how this idea came to me, uh, to start the process of deradicalization and reintegration of the people and to challenge this uh, uh, extremist ideas. Tell us a little bit about your organization. It doesn't sound like you have ever espoused this takfiri ideology that you mentioned. So how is it that you and your organization are going to be able to talk with people who share that ideology or who believe in, in that? I, I know this ideology um, since I came back in Kosovo. I mean, I saw people with this ideology there. I, see pe I saw people with this ideology in Kosovo. I. Uh, I started to read more about uh, this ideology and I, I know uh, which are the strong points and which are the weak points of this ideology and uh, somehow we can speak this kind of language and I think we are most accept acceptable to the people to talk with them uh, because I was part of this process all the time, I was part of Syrian conflict, uh, I got arrested, I have a trial now and uh, somehow I can feel what they feel to. And uh, believe me, most of them are just victims of this ideology. Uh, if you give them a chance, a second chance in their life, I think they will uh, become normal and they will be ready to be reintegrated in society. What should the Kosovo government do with returning fighters or even with people it intercepts who have a wish to go and participate in the conflict? I think uh, until now they, uh, they use the bad way of uh, of uh, countering viol violent extremism. They use only the hard power. They are uh, arresting people. And uh, I think it's not the best way. You, you cannot just put people in prison because uh, then you will uh, radicalize, uh, radicalize them more and more and you will have also radicals in prison and outside the prison. And the phenomena, phenomena of extremism will just increase. Uh, I think that uh, government has to give a second uh, a second alternative, which is soft power, and this is means to help us, to help civil society, to help uh, media and imams to pre uh, pre uh, prevent these ideas, and also to uh, help people to become a part, useful part of society. Has there been any evidence of radicalization already in Kosovo's prisons? Yes, I think there are some cases. Uh, we have uh, some uh, people with uh, criminal background who are very dangerous and they just need this emotional support and if you give this uh, support and if you give this uh, uh, feeling to hate the system and to hate the state they are uh, they are ready to to become extremists so imagine it's not the problem someone who uh, learned how to use a kalashnikov in syria and came back it's uh, the problem will be uh, much deeper if someone with uh, who is criminal uh, uh, ordinary criminal uh, or psychopath uh, will become radical and then yeah we will have uh, we will have a big problem but house arrest might not also be a solution because we did have news this week that uh, someone who was under house arrest for a year or so has also disappeared from Kosovo uh, yes I think uh, the judicial system in Kosovo is not working I mean you have to categorize uh, categorize people you have to know who is more dangerous and who is not who is more sincere and who is not you cannot put all people together. And it was the mistake from the beginning of process. They put us together. I, was, I got arrested together with 39 other people and I didn't uh, know them at all. And we were at the same uh, category as a part of a criminal organization and we didn't even knew each other. So you cannot put me in the same category with people uh, who, are, uh, who were in Syria for 10 months or twice uh, during this time. 
so uh, the judicial system is not simply is not working. They don't uh, they they see us as the same people, and uh, it it has to be this classification of of the people. You are one of the people who is being subject to um, lengthy court proceedings on charges for participating in the conflict. What can you say about the current system, the current legal framework, or the current um, uh, approach of the prosecution to to handle these issues if there's been no acquittals? I think they have no idea what are they doing. Uh, they are just uh, making, uh, making charges against people with no evidences at all. For example, in my case, they used, or if I can say they, they misused my declaration and they took parts of it to make a charge, but they don't have any other evidence, they don't have SMS, they don't have picture, they don't have videos or nothing, they even don't have uh, a guy who will uh, say something against me in the court. Uh, at the end, it, it is not just my case, it is uh, almost all the cases are the same. They don't have any proof, they maybe in, uh, in some cases they have, but in, mostly, uh, in most cases they don't have proofs. And they don't have arguments, they don't have nothing. Is there anything the government has, that has done that has been effective? Has the passage of this law last year uh, been an effective way to stop people from going to Syria? I don't know, maybe it had uh, an impact for a short time. But as I heard uh, on the last month, uh, some people are missing now and Probably they are part of the conflict now, so I, I don't think it is the right way uh, just to use force, force and uh, arresting people and putting people in prison. Uh, because it can give effect for a short time, but in long terms uh, we have to deal with process of deradicalization and we have to give people the opportunity to uh, become useful part of society and we need to uh, Give, uh, give them a sense that they are important in, in our society. So how is your organization going to contribute to that? First of all, uh, our mission is to help people uh, who were engaged in Syrian, uh, Syrian conflict or in conflicts outside, the, outside our borders. Uh, but also uh, the main mission of our institution is to challenge the ideas and to challenge extremism with our ideas and with uh, uh, purest arguments from Islam, uh, which are Quran and Sunnah, and uh, I think these are the main weapons that we have. We also need to help the, uh, the families affected from the, uh, this process because our families were mostly affected from this uh, process, and we will uh, work close with families, we will uh, work with imams, we will work also with institutions, with uh, other NGOs, with, uh, with civil society, uh, with former fighters. Uh, to have a, a result of a result of uh, from all this process, which uh, which is the not to have uh, other potential victims and not to have other people who are joining the foreign conflicts. Now that you've established your NGO, have the government institutions come to ask for your guidance or advice in creating de-radicalization programs or setting up their policies? Uh, no, none of them. I just had uh, a conference uh, a few days ago. I was uh, I got invitation from Ministry of Internal uh, Affairs, and yeah, yes, it was a big honor to to participate in this conference. But it was the only and uh, the first and the only uh, case that they invited me uh, to tell them my ideas, and uh, I'm I'm telling them that uh, we need their support, and uh, we need uh, the their cooperation. I, I hope they will uh, come to us and they will offer their help to prevent extremism and uh, to help us in the process of deradicalization. When you consider that the war in Syria has been going on now for more than five years and you see that uh, the international community has not intervened to stop it but in, in many cases has intervened like Russia to, to, to make the violence worse, do you think that it's unfair to uh, criminalize people with good intentions who wanted to go and help uh, the struggle against Assad's army? Uh, yes, I think it, it is unfair and I think that the uh, international community had to intervene uh, at early stages of the conflict. They had to intervene in 2011 or 2012 when Assad regime used this, uh, the chemical uh, weapons against his own people. But they didn't intervene and, and they gave time to uh, extremist groups to become stronger and stronger. 
uh, and now the Russia is, uh, is interventing to help Assad and they are committing more crimes, war crimes. And uh, also the coalition forces are not doing the best job there. And yes, I think, uh, I still think that uh, people uh, with, good, uh, with good will, uh, they should be allowed to help others. But uh, I don't know if I should say this or not. <laughs> I mean, we have one law uh, uh, which says that we don't have to participate in foreign conflicts. But, not, but honestly, I think, uh, for example, if Albanians in Macedonia, in uh, Montenegro, or in eastern part of Kosovo, or southern part of Serbia, would have, have a problem, I mean, I will not ask no one, not even government. I will go to help them. I know I, I face the prison, but it is my, my uh, place. It is, uh, uh, they are my people, and I need to help them. Uh, somehow, even even for Syria, uh, I think this uh, this law is uh, not not the best one. They uh, they need to have one law uh, which punishes participation in terrorist organization, but not necessary to uh, stop people to help others. Have you already been able to persuade people from not going? Uh, like somebody who was considering going to join the conflict? And have you been able to already persuade people not to go? Yes, uh, it was, uh, it was, uh, how can I say? I, I stopped so many people. Uh, at least I stopped 10 people from joining uh, the conflict in Syria and Iraq, just because I, I knew the reality there. And I knew that they will not help no one. They just will be the problem for, for the people. But also I think the main impact uh, that I, or the main contribution that I gave uh, for this process is that I started to speak on public. And uh, in all of my interviews, I, I said people not to join uh, the conflict in Syria or Iraq, because I, I knew that they will end in terrorist organizations and they will not help no one, nobody. What do you think was the most persuasive part of your argument when you're talking person to person uh, about with people who are thinking about going there, what is the what is the best way to persuade them? Uh, I explained I explained them the situation in details, uh, and I think uh, they heard at me because it's uh, information from the first hand. And uh, even if they thought to go, they started to think. They started to have critical thinking, and uh, after a few days or a few weeks. Uh, the war between groups, several groups just started and uh, they, they knew that it is uh, going to be uh, worst in Syria. Mr. Berisha, thank you so much for joining us. Thank today. you for having me.